<laughs> okay, we're on. We're on. Okay. So what I'm going to do the first um, 45 minutes is um, show you how I approach a representational painting in watercolor. And then after the break, I'm going to um, show how I uh, approach a non-objective painting in acrylic. Um, I, I sort of live in both worlds. I love the transparency of watercolor, yet I get a little bored and then I switch over to my acrylics and texture really excites me and, um, and uh, shapes that don't make sense. So, um, so anyway, um, I'll start out, like I said, with a um, representational. I do a value study. Um, I have a couple of references here that um, I'm going to sort of, oops, I'm not on. There we go. Is that okay? Yeah, you're on, except that I wanted to get this higher so people could see it. Let's see if I do this. There, now I can look up at the ceiling. <laughs> a little too high there. Okay, I got it. I, I think it's a little bit more. Yeah. That's it. Okay, I got it. We're good? Alrighty. So, um... um it's because the sun it's is the coming sun. through there and it shades down. There's nothing we can do. Okay. Alexa, turn off the sun. <laughs> <laughs> As the evening goes on, it will get better. <laughs> So anyway, this, this is, what was my, is my inspiration for tonight's demo. I've done a couple of different value studies. I think I'll go, uh, go with this one. I just used two markers, Prismacolor uh, markers. I use a black and then a 40% marker, doing like a three value um, study, white being the white of the paper. So we'll just start, start out with this. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask as I paint. You won't bother me at all. Would you lay something down on that? Yes. Lisa? What? Would you lay something down on your paper so I can focus this on, on a line or something? Is that okay? Well, I'm trying to see if that's, that's about as focused we can get it. Isn't it? Yeah, okay. It doesn't look focused. Yeah, it's still right. Okay, so um, I do a three-step process in watercolor. Uh, the first wash that I will be doing will consist of my light values. Uh, my second wash that I'll be doing will consist of my middle values, and then I'll finish it up with my dark values here. I always paint background to foreground, big shapes to small shapes, light value to dark value. Okay, so I'm going to just start to throw some paint on here. Like I said, painting from the background to the foreground. Um, I've sort of, um, I like a little bit of each of the, the references, so I'm gonna sort of combine them a little bit. What kind of paper? I use Arches 140 pound uh, cold press paper, and the pigments that I like are American Journey, um, <coughs> Um, cheap, they're, they're through cheapjoes.com. I like them because they're the 37 millimeter tubes and they, um, they really last a long time and the quality of, of paint is, is also very good. So. so the first application of paint, what I do is I try to match the local color. The local color meaning the color that I, I see on the reference unless I'm, um, if I've decided to change the color palette then I'll sort of um, veer off there, but the first application of paint is just sort of documenting that local color and the basic shapes of the, um, the basic shapes that um, I'll be using here. Just trying to block it out there. I think I'll carry this all the way down to the foreground here for the water here. I, I think I'm a little uh, looser painter. I'm not real um, detailed. I just sort of like to capture more or less the essence of what I'm saying and um, keep it pretty simple. All right, now 
I'll go in and start to define a little bit of the shapes here. So as I start to compose the shapes, um, I'm sort of aware of the halfway mark of the paper uh, horizontally and vertically. And I'm going to try to avoid putting a vertical shape here, therefore not creating two equal shapes here or here. So um, compositionally, that's sort of um, in the back of my mind here a little bit. I'm going to come in and um, start to describe a little bit of some um, evergreen shapes here. Here, here, here. Sort of thinking of the positive shape as well as the negative shapes around there. I forgot the beach. I better throw the beach in before I forget here. Put that in there, something like that. What color is the beach? Yellow ochre for now. That's subject to change here. As you can see, there's quite a bit of moisture in the brush. Um, I'm using a um, natural haired brush there for it really holds a lot of water, so I'm going to just um, try to control that amount of water on the, um, the page there. Dropping the horizon line past the halfway mark there. Bringing up some shapes there. <coughs> Color is getting a little boring, so let's spice it up a little bit here. So this is just sort of the first placement of shapes here. Trying to make the shapes a little bit different in size. Do you ever do any lifting? I do, yep. Not at this stage, but as time goes on, um, I'll do that. So there's a little shape in the distance here that I'm going to um, drop in and I want to convey some aerial perspective, so I'm going to just add a touch of that complement there to push that shape back there a little bit. Keep it very um, simple and edge, edges soft. Since the paper is so wet, it'll, it'll be fine. I'm going to come in now and uh, describe the rocks. I use a credit card, a third of a credit card, um, to describe the, um, the rocks. I'm um, going to use some cobalt blue and some um, burnt sienna for the rock color here. And I'm going to compose it once again with the positive shape versus the negative shape here. <coughs> and then just come out here, maybe add a couple more shapes over here. What do you mean by a credit card? Um, a credit card that I cut into thirds. Yeah. And I'll show you in just a second here. <laughs> it's quite exciting. <laughs> <laughs> My husband just likes that I don't shop with him. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm waiting, now I just need some of the water to um, absorb out of the paper until the shine goes away. If I go in at this time, it would, um, I just scrape it back to the, um, the white of the paper. Just going to anchor it down because the paper is starting to dry a little bit with a couple of bulldog clips here. That will ensure that it will dry nice and flat and I won't have to worry about flattening it after there. So I'm just going to use the edge of a credit card that you can see here. I've sort of cut here. And it still has a little too much shine in it, but we'll, for demo's sake, just move along. So basically, I'm just moving this paint um, off of the surface of the paper, scrape, scratching back to the, um, the white of the paper here. Thinking of variations of sizes, large, small, um, Something that always resonates in my mind when I do rocks 
in art school, my fundamentals instructor always would walk by me and say, nice baked potatoes, and keep on going when I was making rocks. <laughs> so whenever I make a rock, I say, no baked potatoes. <laughs> no baked potatoes. <laughs> so. so I'm just going to move that along here. Shapes and front of shapes, small shapes, big shapes, pretty organic shapes. Don't want a, a too geometric shapes there. Further back, a little bit more of a um, smaller shapes. Then I'm just going to soften the bottom edge of those. That damp brush here. And that's the first step. Are you able to hold it up and show us to it the old fashioned way? Do what? The board just like that, yeah. Because oh, it's uh, not showing up as well as it likes. Oh, okay. And I've done. Um, one ahead of time because I knew this would be too wet to paint on here. So I'll just, I think they're pretty similar. Well, the rocks are actually better on this one, but we're going to move on. I can walk that around if you want. What? I can walk that around so people can oh. see it. Oh, okay. So now I'm going to focus a little bit more on my middle values here, starting to build up the form on some of the shapes here. Paying to attention to my value study here a little bit. Did you show us uh, your value study? I did. So you did? Yeah. Oh, I wanted to get on again. Uh huh. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah. So now I'm going to start pushing the middle values here. So therefore, using a little bit more pigment, redefining the tree trunks here so I can sort of see where I'm going. There we go. Trying to preserve that um, lighter value as much as I can because, as you know, as a watercolorist, once we lose those lights, somehow the party's over. So. <laughs> Try to bring them back, but you know how that goes. Watercolor ground. What? Yeah. Watercolor ground. Yes, there's that. So, okay. or there's gesso. There's gesso. <laughs> Check that um, first painting next to the um, uh, screen here. Um, I was going through some. Um, thank you. Um, old paint, watercolor paintings. And that was one of them. And I took gesso to it and redid the whole foreground. And I like it a lot better. Sometimes you just have to take a risk. And, um, and sometimes it pays off, sometimes it doesn't. But what do you have to lose? It's still a loser, so forget it. You know, move on. <laughs> so, so let's just vary this color a little bit here. My pigment's so a little dry here. So, oops, a little too dark too soon. Just delete that out here a little bit. Trying to connect these two shapes here. Trying not to make the shapes too much the same size because that'll be boring. So we're going to have a papa, baby, and mama shape here. Trying, like I said, to preserve a little bit of that underpainting here. Just thinking of shapes, not lines. This is a little darker value under here. Start to develop that a little bit, connect it with that shape a little bit there. 
What colors do you use for your dark green? Uh, well, the three blues that I use are cerulean, cobalt, and ultramarine. And then I have three yellows. I have a, a cool and warm of each of the primaries. I have Windsor yellow and Aurelian. Uh, That's my yellow primary. My red primary is Windsor red and alizarin crimson. And then my um, blue is cobalt blue and ultramarine blue. So the greens that I make usually are with the Windsor yellow gamboge. We're starting at cerulean as I move into my middle values. I'll use cobalt blue. And then as I move into my darker values, I'll use ultramarine blue. Getting a little dark there. And let's see this shape over here. Push back further here. Another shape here. Just conveying some um, foliage over here. I'm going to come in and soften some edges a little bit. Always soften from the light value to the dark value. blue I think I'll try to drop it in on a couple other areas here it will help with eye movement I have this lighter value here so I want to preserve this so I'm going to just do a little negative painting this is the positive I'm going to paint negatively around that shape there to preserve some of this lighter value there indicate I think this negative shape back here needs a a little bit more interest, so I'm going to come back in here and just add a little bit more of a shape. I sort of like that lighter value shape, so maybe I'll just come in with maybe a real light value back here, something that just brown it up a little bit here. Oh, that's sort of nice, the brown complements. Maybe we'll throw in a little bit more of that here there. Yeah. Do you ever use dry brush? Um, or, or not? I do when I'm picking something up. I'll do like a thirsty brush. But um, as you can see, I'm pretty loose and wet. I don't like too many um, <coughs> too much dry brush there. Yeah, a little choppy shape there. Trying to figure out if I want to keep, I think I do want to keep some of those shapes. I'm going to come in and do a little negative painting now on the rocks here. Let me use some, uh, the two darks um, out of my palette are consistent. I use ultramarine blue and burnt sienna as one dark. And then my darkest dark to achieve this value, I use alizarin crimson and Windsor green. Come in here now and do a little negative painting, starting to pop some of these out. I think this will sort of be my more center of interest in this area here. Sort of trying to entertain the viewer here. Lose the edge on the back of the shape. There we go. I feel very fortunate about 30 years ago when I joined North Star to. Um, I was the workshop chair and I was able to uh, study with, um, you can stand wherever you want, I don't care if you can't see. Um, I was able, through uh, workshops, I was able to study with some wonderful nationally, national artists. Um, and um, it really helped me, um, helped my work a lot. And one thing I noticed um, through studying with a lot of these people 
I went a little too dark too soon, looks like. It's better. Um, uh, Chanky Chi and um, Tony Couch and uh, Tony Van Hasselt and Frank Webb and um, people of that era, um, they're kept coming, um, uh, I kept noticing that the name Edgar Whitney kept coming up and uh, all of these people had studied with this man, Edgar Whitney, and he was a wonderful instructor. He um, lived on the East Coast and um, he really had quite, quite the following of people. Um, I'm not thrilled with this negative shape here, so I'm going to throw in another positive shape here and just develop that a little bit. Oops, too intense there. Knock that down a little bit. Um, so, um, these people that had studied with Edgar Whitney um, saw great improvement in their work. I just need to soften this edge here a little bit. And he had some wonderful sayings. Um, he also wrote a book, if any of you are interested, The Complete Guide to Watercolor Painting, Edgar Whitney. And then Ron Ranson, another wonderful artist of that time, um, uh, collected um, with uh, several of these artists, um, some of whom I'm sure, um, let's see, Skip Lawrence, Chanky Chi, Tony Couch, Judy Wagner, Frank Webb, Barbara Nietzsche, um, Henry, I didn't study with Henry, um, Tony Van Hasselt. Um, but some of the, um, the sayings, I think, of Edgar Whitney are, are just so, um, so wonderful and priceless of that, of that time. Um, and, you, and I heard this quite uh, repeatedly throughout these, all these different instructors. Um, it said, he, some of his quotes, um, invite the viewer into the picture and entertain him everywhere. Uh, plan like a turtle, paint like a rabbit. <laughs> Photos transcribe life while paintings translate life. Design is like gravity, the force that holds it all together. You are symbol collectors. You are my host in that rectangle. You mustn't bore me. Change is the only antidote to boredom. Um, think more, paint less. Um, the amateur is afraid of boldness, and the professional is afraid of timidity, to being timid. Isn't that true? So anyway, if anyone's interested, you're welcome to look at these books here. But um, I just thought it was interesting through the years of studying um, and having North Star offer such wonderful national uh, recognized workshops uh, that were very affordable at that time. Uh, because when I was studying with all these people, I had a small, uh, my children were young, and, and I really didn't have a lot of time to spend on painting. So it really was um, a nice way to, um, <coughs> to just sort of um, come in and learn a lot. Just going to pull out the credit card a little bit here. Um, some dead whatever. Can only get in trouble with that credit card, so you got to put it aside. <laughs> I'm going to soften this edge over here. Don't want too much going on near the edges of the composition there. So the waters I uh, have in my value study pretty middle value. Um, there isn't a strong uh, light source, so there isn't too much uh, reflections going on, but it's a little boring, so we're going to spice it up. So. Yeah. so do you feel like you paint better when you paint faster? Uh, this is my normal speed. Okay. I don't know. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was thinking about that quote. Uh, oh, um, of Edgar Whitney? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I do. <clears throat> like he said, it's, it's planning. And I remember with studying with Mr. Frank Zeller, um, him telling me that your value study is your road map to success. So... Things like that too. I'll pay you later. Yes. 
Pat, get your name in there, Frank. <laughs> so just trying to document a little bit of reflection here. A little bit of beach here and there. A little bit of this here. Ideally, I would let that shine go away before softening those, but I'm going to try to just move it along here. This value is a little too light up there. Just going to knock that down a little bit. Not too intense. Knock it down there. Yeah, there we go. That's better. very impatient as you can see but we have to wait until that water evaporates and then we'll soften those edges so maybe we'll start moving down that value scale and working more into this range now wrapping it up you gotta hit the south right? whoopsie my mic went out hmm? yeah. am I back on no no, no. is that better yeah. can you hear me now yeah. no, no. no? Okay. Now? Can you hear me? No. Oh, now can you hear me? Yes. So what's the problem there? The green is light. So I think that means that it should be on. Okay. So I'm going to move into that um, ultramarine blue. Um, Burnt sienna mixture is the first dark here. Gonna come in with a little indication of a little bit more of a tree trunk here or there. There we go. Oh, I think I'm on. Okay. I can hear it here. There we go. I'm going to just soften a couple of edges here, like this hard edge. I don't like that shape sitting on top of the rock, so I'm just going to erase that out of there. There we go, that's a little better. French scrubber through cheapjoes.com. It's a, uh, I believe, gold hair, very stiff. It's great. I use these two tools for erasing. This is just a stencil brush, and then this is even a little stiffer. If I really want to get back to the white of the paper, I'll use this. If I just want to really soften an edge, I can go in and use this here. So. Alrighty. We're just going to pick up some of that. Alrighty, let's just soften this here. 